Good day, Danny. First of all, hi, guy. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. First of all, all right. let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me over Skype. I hope our connection is good enough here that it doesn't get blurry and all those kinds of things, which tends to happen on occasion. Sure. For our audience, could you please introduce yourself and tell us where you live and work and what you do? Yeah, I'm Danny Langdon. Uh, I've been an ISBI member for 53 years. I don't know where that time went. <laughs> Uh, I was born and raised in uh, Twin Falls, Idaho, so I'm an Idaho boy, and uh, came from a, a very uh, functional family, I might add, a little unusual kind of family in the sense that uh, my parents were scrap iron dealers, and so I had this environment in which to run around and learn all kinds of performance technology things before those words ever came along, uh, and uh, parents who really very much encourage their kids to develop themselves to their full so I feel blessed in that sense uh, currently through a long road uh, I live in Bellingham Washington uh, our, one of our daughters lives here which we're very fortunate to have a granddaughter around to to muse and ruin as much as we can uh, we came here vis-a-vis -vis Santa Monica California which is an entirely different environment, uh, a great environment in the sense of its diversity, which I loved dearly. I had scads of friends there. Uh, I made my way in terms of profession uh, from Idaho, I'd say, to Missouri, to uh, Ethiopia, uh, back down the road to New York City, uh, out to California, back to Pennsylvania, to Idaho, to California, and then to the state of Washington. Mm -hmm. So I've done a bit of traveling. I, I consider myself a travel addict. I've been in 85 countries. I've been in half of those at least three, four times. I love culture. I love working with people. And I don't take work too seriously. <laughs> I'm, I'm very good at it. I have a model for what work is, interestingly enough, but work is not the most important thing in life. It's more about culture. It's more about relaxing and enjoying things. And I can honestly say my life now in 80 years of practice has been absolutely tremendous. And I'm one of those lucky ones who happens to be married to another performance technologist and we were in business together successfully for 25 years and still do an occasional thing here and there. So I think that's a synopsis of my life to a certain degree. Thank you. Can you share with us uh, where you went to college and what you studied? Sure. I'm uh, a graduate of uh, the University of Idaho at Moscow. I have a chemistry degree essentially to teach chemistry. Uh, I went from there to the University of Missouri to get a master's degree I only went there because I had heard about this particular professor who was supposed to be one of those who could really motivate you, and in fact he did. And so I got a master's degree in a school administration, thinking that someday I might do that. Uh, beyond that, academically, I, I kept sort of putting my toes back in the academic world, uh, thinking that I'd, someday I might want to get a, a doctorate. Uh, so when I came back from the Peace Corps, I went to New York University uh, for a year. And while I was there, I taught in a local uh, high school chemistry. I, uh, I didn't particularly like New York University. Probably half of that had to do with the fact that I had been in Ethiopia, which is basically the 8th century at that time. I'm sure it's graduated now to at least the 12th century. Uh, and so I packed up the family. Uh, we left to go to California, and there's a whole story around that. I uh, academically I came, I took a job in Pennsylvania, so I started going to the Annenberg School of Communication, uh, which I rather enjoyed uh, for a year, and there's a story as to why I left that place. And finally, I started taking courses uh, at Georgetown University. Uh, through uh, Don Bullock and uh, completed about a year's worth there. So I've got enough credits to almost have a doctor's degree. Mm -hmm.
but something happened along that that line where I thought, you know, uh, enough of this. I, I, I'll continue to educate myself, but what I really need to do is start writing. And so that's what I did. And I wrote several things, which we can uh, cover somewhere along the line here. Well, So that's my academic background. Yeah, so how did you go from academia to business and become a consultant? What's Tell us that story. Well, uh, the long version of that is... Uh, when I got back from uh, the Peace Corps uh, and went to New York University, uh, I think I fully intended to continue this teaching career. I was a very good chemistry teacher, actually. Interestingly enough, I, I brought the systems kind of approach to that uh, in such a way that my students were able to successfully learn chemistry without having to memorize it. And so I probably would have stayed with that, except I, uh, when I packed up the family and left New York University and teaching there in New Jersey, I put everything in our 1960 Chevy ugly station wagon, literally everything we had, I drove out to California. Uh, her parents from, were from Vallejo. And I had heard through the Peace Corps of the existence of uh, the then new Job Corps program started under the Johnson administration. And uh, they had a, uh, a new facility over in Pleasanton, California, and it was run by Litton Industries, which is a very large corporation at that, at that point in time. And uh, I went over there to talk to them, uh, really, because I needed a job. I, I was traveling across the country, if you can imagine, in June, looking for a chemistry job, and these jobs are already filled, which was a little foolish on my part. But anyway, I'd heard about these, perhaps a job at this job course center. So I went over there, and they really didn't want to hire teachers. Uh, these were kids that would have been either thrown out or dropped out of, of school. And they wanted people who could really relate to them. Therefore, they were hiring everything from bartenders to whatever else, as long as that person could really relate to these students and help them change in some kind of fundamental way. And I think they were interested in me because I'd been in the Peace Corps. And so they took a chance on me. And for a year, I taught uh, personal development. And that meant I was teaching math, English, it's something they call personal development. Uh, there were no materials to speak of, although this company <laughs> had bought from itself extensive binders of material that were totally irrelevant to whatever uh, you know was going on. So I started writing things. Uh, I developed a how to find a job. I I did a film uh, from scratch on dining room behavior of all things. I did things around terminology in, in uh, unions because these kids would more than likely work for that. And, and something happened in that process of writing these things and, and using it in my classroom where other people wanted to use it and next thing you know, other job career centers wanted to use it. So apparently I was developing something here. And the next thing I know, after having taught a year in this uh, as a teacher, they asked me to join their curriculum development department. And I thought that would be kind of interesting because I was really enjoying developing these instructional materials. And believe it or not, when I joined that department uh, and had, was writing my first program, somebody said to me, what you need in here is a set of objectives. And I said, okay, uh, I think I understand what an objective is, but I didn't. So. Uh, they introduced me to the idea of, of objectives uh, via uh, Bob Maker because he was you know, developing and publishing his first books about that time. We're talking now 1965. And so uh, I read about that and put it into one of my programs. And interestingly enough, within six months, I was the head of that department suddenly. Now, I've got all this extensive experience, you can tell, of, of all of teaching and, and, and so on, and then uh, writing programs, and, and, and I'm head of six people. And I did that for six months. And I always remember my boss 
every time we'd have a meeting, he would say, if a good job comes along, take it. And then he was imagining that this job course center was going to go away. And he was right. It, in fact, it did go away two years later. So I thought, well, you, you need to protect yourself. Go out and take a look. So I'm talking to one of the guys at the Job Corps Center, and he says, the place you really ought to go to, there's a company over in Palo Alto, which is not far away, and it's run by a, a fellow by the name of Dr. William A. Detterline. It's called General Program Teaching. It's a division of Commerce Clearinghouse, which has nothing in the world to do with uh, development of training materials, but that's what this company does. So I made an appointment went over there and interviewed with Bill, and uh, uh, he seemed to like me, and he, he hired me as a person to write programmed instruction, which I had never written before. But he seemed to feel that somehow or another, with all my vast experience, I'm sure that I could learn how to write programmed instruction. So uh, we agree on a date to start. I get over there, and I walk in the door, and I go into his office, and, you know, I'm ready to go. And he says, by the way, things have changed slightly. And it, what had happened is over the weekend, uh, he had met with the folks from uh, Commerce Clearinghouse. And they pretty much let him know that he wasn't much of an administrator. And he damn well better find somebody who was a good administrator to do that so that he could devote his attention to the stuff that he was really strong in. So he turns to me and he says, you're now going to be the head of 26 people. I thought, that's interesting. I've gone from no people to six people to 26 in the course of a year. So I took that on. Uh, I guess I just had enough nerve to, to really think that I could, could do this kind of stuff. And it was absolutely fascinating because now I was involved in all kinds of different programs being developed by all kinds of different people. And at the same time, I was given responsibility for certain uh, programs. One of those, which really turned out to be the essence of really getting started in this field, uh, was to develop a training program for the Bank of America, for operations officers, they're called. They're the people who actually run the bank. And they had been spending literally millions of dollars in their training of effort uh, for here, for, for that particular need on their part. And uh, Bill managed to convince them that they ought to try something called learner-controlled instruction. And the expert in learner-controlled instruction was in that town, and his name was Dr. Robert F. Mager. And he was an expert because he tried it once. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, yeah, okay, that's, that sounds about right. So they put me in charge of uh, developing uh, this program with the subject matter experts from uh, the bank, plus there were a couple people from our end. And I had to learn, find out what this thing was. So I, I got a hold of Bob Mager, and uh, we sort of added him on as a consultant to this project and talked to him about what it was and so on. And it really wasn't a lot of information. It was, it was kind of stunning to me that uh, more guidance couldn't have been given. So I was left figuring this thing out essentially myself. And, and the words are, uh, and the concept uh, were pretty uh, understandable, you know, that, that there must be a way that you can say, here are the 200 things you need to learn, and, and they are uh, defined in measurable terms as objectives are, and that if you find all the various material that, uh, just a minute, I th I, we're going to lose our power here or something. So uh, let me, uh, get it. I, I can see what's happening right there. Okay, we're back in. So uh, the concept I thought was pretty clear. How to execute it was another matter. So I proceeded to have people, you know, identify all these objectives, and there were about 300 of them. And uh, they had all kinds of material, and we keyed them to them. And we developed uh, measurements for all of those 300 things and, uh, and, and came up with some uh, other kinds of uh, learning artifacts, as it were, uh, so that they were 
matched better to those objectives rather than just assuming that a textbook would be a great thing. We incorporated a great deal of, uh, of using the experts within the bank. Uh, the training was put right into the bank so that they could access literally as they were learning anybody in the bank they wanted to access. And what happened with this program is that in the first year it saved the bank a million and a half dollars. I thought, you know, that's pretty damn good. Mm -hmm. So I did this thing, uh, the grunt work on all of this business, for which Bill Deadline and Bob Meger took all the credit. I, I just thought that was great. <laughs> but I had practice in that already from graduate school where I had done a bunch of work, and the professor took the credit mm -hmm. for it. And I was okay with this whole thing, you know, because I was kind of enjoying learning the process. So... Uh, being at that company uh, was so unique and so nice because Bill became my mentor. And just to tell a couple little stories about it, you know, Bill was the first one. Uh, and, and by the way, in the area were all these other people, uh, Peter Pipe, uh, Bob Morgan, uh, and gosh, I'm, I'm going to forget some names, but there were, there were several other people right in that area that that would just drop in and you'd have this opportunity to talk to them. But Bill uh, was the first person who ever developed really uh, a performance technology workshop. Mm -hmm. And he, he did it for uh, industry. And, and then he did a version for education. Uh, he called it instructional technology, I think, at the time. And I helped him develop that course. Uh, again, he was the kind of person who could conceptually could just put this stuff together and it wouldn't communicate necessarily real well so he'd give it to me and I would translate it almost in a sense and help him get it together then go out and help him teach it and I always thought it was kind of strange because I didn't know how much I really knew it, but it was a matter of this is something new and exciting and kind of different let's 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 go with the flow so I went out with him uh, the first two times and then the third time, we went to uh, New York City, and we had a group from Transworld Airlines who were going to take this workshop, and it was two weeks long. And we walk in, and Bill introduces himself, introduces me, and then says, uh, I, Danny will be teaching the rest of the workshop. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. He had not told me a thing about this. And so, <laughs> what else are you going to do? And I always remember, he had four days of stimulus response to teach. Now, stimulus response to me is perhaps one of the most boring topics you could ever teach. But how you could take four days to do it is beyond me. But he had all these series of exercises to do and so on. So I was left to teach this thing. And that's kind of the way Bill was. He could just throw you into the fire. Uh, he, he, he had me take a group one time in Palo Alto out to dinner, uh, and then he didn't show up. <laughs> and I've got these 10 important people, you know, that could potentially be clients in the future where I'm work, doing a workshop. And I don't have a credit card. Those were the days where credit cards were not that, that prevalent. Mm -hmm. And so I had no money to pay for this bill, you know, for the restaurant. And I literally had to find somebody to run him down find him at home, get some cash, bring it over so I, can, so I can pay for this thing. And he was always doing something like that. And I don't know whether he did it just to see how you would react and what you would do or whether he was just a, too damn lazy sometimes or just didn't think about it, okay? Mm -hmm. So, But it was a great experience and uh, not to dwell on it too much more, but uh, I, I got recruited out of that job uh, and the company folded a, uh, a year later. By the way, I've been in three, or f at least three situations where I've been with companies that folded later on, and I don't know whether it's because I left or <laughs> because I was there. <laughs> but anyway, I got recruited out to a job in uh, Pennsylvania, and I never thought in the life, my life, that I would ever go to Pennsylvania or back east to really live. But it was a fascinating opportunity. Uh, there was a, a kind of a university in a sense, but also an industry. It was the American College of Life Underwriters. 
those are the people who provide training in uh, CLUs, Chartered Life Underwriters. Uh, but they're an insurance industry, uh, having this academic wing, as, as it were, practical academics, I should say. Uh, and they had a guy there that they wanted to honor by building the building. And the building would do have a certain function to it. And that function was to research adult learning. And they put together a design for this building, which was absolutely marvelous. And it sat in this environment. It was just absolutely beautiful overlooking a lake. And, and so from a, a purely uh, physical point of view, it was a great place to go to and explore. And they, they hired me as their director of instructional design. And they, they didn't even know what an instructional designer was. Uh, and, the, and the field of instructional design was just coming to be. And a friend of mine who worked uh, for Equitable Life had suggested me because he knew that that's basically what I was doing. And so I get hired to this job for a title that I sort of have to make be what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. And so in that process, I was allowed to hire a few people, one of which was Dick Lincoln. Later on, Harold Ramlow was there, uh, the two people that are associated with the ISPI. Uh, I didn't ha because I didn't have a doctor's degree, I could not be the head of it, which was okay with me because I had these things that I wanted to do purely you know, from a personal point of view. And one of the things, uh, for a while there, I had a staff of about 18 people or so. And, and I, I simply went to the management one day and said, look, I'd really like to do some instructional design research. I'd like to come up with some different ways to structure adult learning. And they said, okay. So I stepped aside and I was allowed to then go and do what I wanted to do for about a period of three years. And in that process, I came up with three instructional designs. Uh, and I remember going to ISPI and presenting those one time, or one of them in particular. And it was quite an experience. I think I'd been in the society for maybe five years or so. And uh, in those days, uh, the society was small enough that maybe, let's say, 300 people would show up to the conference. Mm -hmm. okay? And they would run, as I recall, two sessions concurrent. So you might have 150 people in one and 150 in the other. And the dynamics of that was absolutely fascinating because you're center stage with 150 people who are going to question what you're doing, not just listening to this thing, okay? And so there was the asking of questions and so on. And I forget who the guy was, but somebody got up and really challenged what I was talking about. And it, it flustered me. I just, I, I started to say, well, maybe you're right. And with that, Joe Harless stood up, just he literally shot out of his seat. <laughs> and he says, no, Langdon's right. Mm. And he went on to explain and defend my position. I thought, my God, there is, there is something, right? Uh, and that, I think, that lesson, particularly right there, was a great one for me. Because I, as, as much as I had been in charge of people and so on, I still had a level of insecurity around what I was doing and how significant it was and so on. And so that, that experience uh, combined with a couple of others, and I'll just mention one other. Uh, I wrote an article for the journal, uh, the uh, Programmed Instruction Journal. And the editor of the journal at that time was Susan Markle Tiemann, who was the first woman president of ISPI, a remarkable woman at the University of Chicago. She had written a book called Good Frames, Bad Frames, and it was just the, kind of the Bible of program destruction. And in the editorial part of that, uh, talking about what was in this particular issue, she said uh, something along the lines in the spirit of, uh, of Bob Makers, blah, 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 Danny Langan has done blah, 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 blah. I thought, my God, she's comparing me to Bob Mager. And I thought, holy crap, how is that possible? You know? But what these people were doing, I think, were really encouraging you. And if you had something valid 
to say and do or whatever. They were reaffirming that for you. And that is a, an extremely important lesson uh, about ISPI. And maybe that's one of the things that kind of gets lost. Uh, I think the early people in that society, and the reason I was particularly attracted to it, other than the fact that Bill Dead Online told me I had to go, <laughs> was that uh, here were people who were fundamentally scientists, some of them, uh, psychologists, practical sociologists. Uh, they were people who were actually doing things. And they were very interested when you came along with something that was either proved or expanded upon something. And if you were good at it, they would tell you. And if you were ordered, they would tell you. So I had lots of that experience early on and exposure to all kinds of people who, who seemed to be willing to talk uh, to me, even though I was pretty young in the field and certainly I didn't come out of that academic background and so on. And I remember talking to Tom Gilbert and uh, Gabe O'Fish and all these people who were the people who started this, this kind of movement, as it were, and they had things they would just say to you occasionally that, that really made you feel like you had something to contribute. So. Uh, that experience at the American College turned out to be perfect in, in, from going from you know this general program teaching thing to doing some basic research. And along the way, I wrote my first book, uh, which had a very long title to it, but uh, it had to do with uh, instructional designs that I had either developed or that I knew about and then incorporated those within it. And as a result of that book, uh, I, I started looking and realizing that there were all kinds of instructional designs, as I called them, out there that weren't being publicized. That some guy or gal somewhere had developed this thing, used it, proved it, and, and then it just stopped there. So I, I started generating a list of what those were, went to, back to this publisher that published my book, and I said, I would like to try to capture these uh, and as a result, I ended up uh, identifying 65 authors to develop 40 volumes. And so that took me into quite a wide range of people, uh, from Tiaki, Stolovich, uh, uh, Wydra, and so on, uh, to people that I didn't know at all. Uh, and uh, I gave them a format for what we wanted, what I wanted and got them to agree to it, gave them, I think, a 9% royalty. And over the course of three years, put together 40 volumes, and it became the definitive resource of, on the various methodologies for how to instruct, how to structure training to meet various needs, and I even put together a system of how to select which one for what purpose it might be. And But the deal was, for me, was I was working with all these people and I was learning things from them mm -hmm. you know that and picking up the valuable lesson here and there which was ultimately going to take me to where I was headed which we haven't quite gotten to in, in, along this long road that I keep meandering around on but anyway working with those 65 people and then there was a guy from Germany who, who just kind of dropped in one day and he says I'm doing something similar at the University of Göttingen in, in Germany on educational methods. Would you mind coming over? I'll, I'll get you some money. Come over and spend a couple of months with me and we'll integrate these things together. Uh, so I did, took family with me and went over there. I got a leave from the uh, college there to do that. I went over and we exchanged information. And again, it was a growing process of, of learning all these other kinds of things. Uh, I came back and uh, as a part of that sabbatical leave, uh, I had structured uh, an opportunity uh, uh, to take six weeks and drive around the United States, literally uh, almost the entire states, all the various states. And I made arrangements with all kinds of people to stop in and talk to them. And so 
it was, you know, stopping to talk to Bob Megger or stopping in the Tiagi in the city. And I think there were about 20, 25 people. And I was collecting information from them around this instructional design thing to find out if there was a way that they actually selected things. And there wasn't. So I thought, well, if there's a problem there. I might as well figure that one out too. So I wrote up some stuff on that. And so I think you're beginning to see that my journey was always uh, a path where an opportunity came up, I go into that opportunity, and I start exploring all kinds of ways that I can increase my knowledge and, and my practice and so on. So uh, they, this, they let me go from the American College. I thought that was really fascinating because... They, <laughs> they had set up a sabbatical program, okay? And the first person who went on that sabbatical program was let go while he was on sabbatical. Okay? Second person who went, same thing happened. And I'm the third person. I thought, I don't know whether to go or not. But I had, I had dedicated myself to coming to that place for 10 years, and 10 years was coming up. So I thought... I earned this sabbatical, I might as well go, I'm going to go to Germany, I'm going to drive around the country. And they allowed me to do that, and before I went, they let me go. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I thought, this is really fortuitous. <laughs> <You know? clears throat> it may look like a, a bad you know, sign or something, but it actually just turned out extremely well, because part of that driving around the United States, I stopped in Idaho to see my family, and learned that there was a job at the Morrison Knudsen Corporation, this very large company of 50,000 employees worldwide. They needed a director of corporate training. So I went over and saw this guy, and, and we talked about it, and I talked about performance technology and so on, and he thought, eh, this, this guy could work. And so he offers me a job. So I've got a job. I haven't finished my sabbatical here. So I finished going around doing that stuff, and then I went to... to uh, to work at that company for 10 years. And, uh, I learned a few things there. I don't think it was the, the best years, uh, but I certainly enjoyed the, the corporate environment. And, uh, you know, I had a, a pretty good staff of people to, to practice things on, as it were. But ultimately, uh, it seemed to me it was time to, to go. And so... Uh, somebody at the company mentioned that there was a company down in California that was looking for somebody to be the head of total quality management. And, and, and Tiki, that uh, quality management movement had been in place for, I don't know, four or five years. And I thought, well, this, this could be interesting to go do. So I did. I went down to California. I got divorced in the meantime. Uh, and uh, went to work at this company. And uh, it was while at that company that uh, I, one of the senior vice presidents of one of the divisions over in Riverside, I believe it was, called me over one day and he said, I'd like you to really help my people out here. here here's the issue. They all work and, they, and they, they know their work, but they don't really know what work is. They don't know what one another's work really is. Can you solve that problem? And I thought, okay. And so I said to myself, what is work? Now, I had had all this stuff going on coming up to that, that point in time where I had learned to write objectives. I had learned from Bill Dennerline, uh, so the, what he called level of specificity. I realized that from the Second World War, when they wanted to define stuff, uh, they'd do a content outline. That's what they knew at the time. And it wasn't until a little bit later that somebody came along and says, well, you really ought to write a goal. And a goal had a certain understanding to it. It wasn't measurable, but it had a certain way of communicating intent. And then objectives came along. Okay? And um, uh, Deadline had done this stimulus response thing on me. So I'd, I'd learned that part. And then... That's, somewhere along the line and reading in various courses that I'd taken through uh, uh, University of Pennsylvania or, or Georgetown or whatever, 
I was learning other kinds of ways to, to try to specify behavior, as it were. I don't care whether that was that. Uh, algorithms, for example, is another way to do things. And so I'm looking at this, trying to figure out what the hell work is. And I thought, the way that we're classically doing it makes some sense, but it, it's not good enough. There's something wrong. And, and, and as I reflect back on it, what I came to realize is that the way we were going about performance technology if you will, was we're looking at it as these are the these are the goals to be achieved. It's uh, and some way or another we're going to define that thing that's to be achieved, whether you call it a need or a set of objectives or whatever you call it, and you define it. It's the thing to be achieved, and there's something fundamentally wrong with that. It, it's good on the surface, but it, it it's not dynamic. And. Uh, I realized that in talking to Don Toasty, whom I think uh, was the most innovative person in our profession, bar none. I mean, he just knew things. He didn't communicate them very often, <laughs> except personally. And I had the pleasure of, of teaching with him in, in some workshops, going to, to Saudi Arabia with him to Ramco and doing those kind of things. And, and I had bought his instructional materials when I was the director of corporate training on man management. They were absolutely excellent. Uh, so if you wanted ideas, you always kind of went to Don. And uh, so Don he started using a word that really began to ring with me. And the word was systemic. That performance technology, as people kept calling it, uh, is a systems approach, but more important than that, and that's what people concentrate on, is the systems approach. You, you figure out the need, you, you identify the intervention, blah, 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 you go through that whole business. But it turns out that's not really the most important part of it. It's this word systemic. And, and what that means is if you can figure out what work is and its elements, and I'm going back to my chemistry now again here, and I think that it's, it's sort of like thinking of the periodic table. The periodic table, it's a list of all the elements, and it looks like nothing but an organization of stuff, but its value is what it can predict. It's not just that it's listed there. Well, in our business, performance is a dynamic system. It's an organism out there, and, uh, and in the profession, we choose you all have chosen to call it performance. I call it work. And the reason I call it work is because that's what everybody does. And that's a word they understand. They don't understand the word performance, I don't think. They understand it in the sense of somebody's performing, you know. But I thought, if these people that this guy's talking about don't understand what work is, I've got to figure out what work is. And so I started to develop uh, a formula, if I, I refuse to call it a formula to begin with because my science wouldn't let me do that, you know, back here, mm -hmm. the back of my brain. So I called it a paradigm of the type, which was very useful because I could look at other paradigms and find out if they were complete or not, and found out many of them were not, uh, like CPOC. CPOC is, is, is a paradigm, but it's not a complete one. It's, it's like getting half of a formula without, you know, the rest of the formula. So, uh, I, I started to figure out what work was, and interestingly enough, the, the thing that allowed me to figure out what it was, was all that stuff that I'd done before. Uh, that I'd look at the idea of objectives and say, well, what's in an objective that is an aspect of work? And, and, it's, and it's given this, <laughs> mm -hmm. well, that must be something like inputs. <laughs> uh, you do this in action, which must be a process, and then you find out whether something's right or wrong, and that's feedback. And I, and I thought, well, those that's part of it. Let's see if there's any other parts. And so I would look at other kinds of uh, paradigms, if you will, or attempts to define performance, like stimulus response. And that would give me another ingredient. And eventually, what I did 
was to be able to come up with uh, a formula, which I didn't start calling a formula till just about three years ago, four years ago, because I was the reason I, I was comfortable now calling it a formula, the work formula it's now known as, was because Kathleen, my partner in life and business, uh, we had gone into business uh, as, as a result after this company I worked for in California. We decided to go into business for ourselves. And we spent the next 25 years doing a proof of concept, you might call it. And that is we were able to take this formula uh, that I developed and start using it in a variety of ways for a variety of needs and so on. And we each time would figure out whether that works. And if it works, it must be valid. And so we would go reorganize uh, an IT department for the, the state of California. Uh, we'd go to the Coast Guard and teach all the Coast Guard admirals how to define their quality program, which really pissed them off. Uh, <laughs> but I knew it worked. Uh, and we'd go to other places and uh, they wanted to institute some new technology, so we'd use the formula to do that. Uh, and there was just all these variety of, of opportunities based upon who would pay us some money in order to go do something. And, and I don't think they understood that we were out there trying to prove a concept, let alone make some money. Okay? Mm -hmm. But we proved that it worked. And then, and only then, was I willing to call it a formula. As I said, that was like three or four years ago. So all of that history, when you ask me how I, what I did and so on, was an entire learning process of figuring out what, again, you all call performance was, but I call work is, and it all eventually led to this, as, as Kathleen sometimes liked to say, the periodic table of work. It's not the periodic table, but it is something like it, and it is a system that is systematic. It's a living organism, and its potential uh, for the field is absolutely tremendous. Uh, there are things that people will be able to do that we, just, we can go into, and I can, I'll, I can talk about the future and what that might be. But it has, because it, I know that it works, because we know that it works, uh, it's, it's a viable system now. And, and, I, and there's some things I want to say about it relative to whether it's our job to do the formula or whether it's their job mm -hmm. to do the Yeah. So that, that's a long history. Of well, that was, that was excellent. That's exactly the kinds of things I, I wanted to get to. You've answered my second question about your first exposure to human performance technology, and it's varied and vast and... Uh, thank you for sharing all of that. Sure. You also, uh, so we, I think we've gotten some of your biggest influences in evidence-based practices for performance improvement or, or work. Um, some of the people that, that influenced you. I wanted to ask you about, uh, as, a, as a, a pointer for others who may watch this video, of things that uh, you might point them to, articles or books that influenced you, but I also want to talk and get from you some of your own previous writings that may still be available for them. Now, I think you were just recently, the work formula, uh, an earlier edition of that was your book, The Language of Work. Is that true? That's true. That was the first uh, attempt to capture mm -hmm. <laughs> what this kind of new model was. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I can distinctly remember writing that book. Mm -hmm. I was still working at this company in California, and uh, I had done that work over in that division where the guy wanted me to figure out what the work was, and, and it, had, it had worked so well when we did it. And uh, So I started writing the book, and so I started thinking beyond that particular application to the, the wider uh, ap implications of this for business. Uh, and. Uh, I would actually shiver sometimes when I started to write how I thought this could be used to do that mm -hmm. because I really realized that this, this formula had a power to it far beyond the, the few applications that I had done. And so 
And I also I want to make sure that people understand that that formula came about as a result of the contact with a number of my prof fellow professionals. Uh, I've already mentioned Don Tosti had a very strong influence on this, particularly that systemic part, but he also had a very strong influence on uh, what a healthy organization was, he called it, okay? Mm -hmm. And he had developed a matrix, and I simply expanded on that matrix when it, it came to applying it to this uh, work formula, this language of work, as I called it. Uh, and there were other people, uh, Gary Rumler, uh, you know, his business was around process. And so I'm, I'm picking up on, on what he's doing. Uh, and, I, and I picked up on things that Dale did, Breath Hour, mm -hmm. and, and uh, Roger Kaufman. So I've tried, and hopefully along the way as I've been doing these things, to give those people credit. I was always giving Don credit because he had so many different things that he did that I was able to help integrate those together and expand upon as they might relate to the concept I was developing. So, uh, I don't know if I'm getting away from your question or not. No, now. you are. You're answering it. But uh, that was, frankly, the power of ISPI. Mm -hmm. That's why ISPI really works for certainly people like me who are there for more than the solution. You know, I, we get these things that we are allowed to do inside companies or for companies, and we can get caught up in, in, in doing those kind of things. But for me, these are all learning situations so that I can figure out how to do the next thing better or, uh, or ultimately put it into the system. So I captured that in that first book, uh, it was called the new language of work. Uh, I just called it the language of work. The publisher wanted to put the word new in there, and I, well, that's kind of a dumb word to put there. But you know, if you're going to get published, you mm -hmm. have to do what they say sometimes. Exactly. And later on, I wrote one called Aligning Performance, and that was uh, an improvement upon that book, and incorporated a number of things that um, that I had learned since, and that sold pretty well. Uh, uh, we, Kathleen and I put together a book on uh, interventions. I was very interested in, in various types of interventions, so we tried to capture the prevailing interventions at the time. Uh, there was about 50 of them, and it even got translated into Korean, I remember. And uh, then, uh, recently, uh, I decided about five years ago that it because of my age and so on, and that, that being basically retired from the field, that, that it was time to capture our intellectual knowledge. So I put together the idea of a three-book series. And while it, it looks like on the surface it's just another explanation of the language work, what it really is is an attempt to get at the major audiences of, of, that we serve and to teach them to be, if you want to call it, performance technologists. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to teach them to be systemic thinking people. And so each book is a different audience, but they're all integrated. They all use the language work. One is for executives, that's the business model. There's one for managers, that's the managing model. And the third one is for the workers, the people who actually do most of the work. And they all are introduced uh, to what the language of work, the work formula, and how to use it. And so, uh, theoretically, you should be able to uh, give this to people as a way to introduce them to a systems approach. Uh, and then, and this is very critical, one has to understand that work is, is the thing that they do. It's their work. Excuse me. <coughs> and they know it pretty well. They just don't know how to define it, one. And two, they don't know how to figure out where the problems are. If they could define it and figure out what the problems are, I guarantee you that they can figure, tell you what the solutions are. So what we have done is figured out a way to introduce this formula very quickly. 
the, I used to do it in like two or three hours, and it drove Kathleen nuts because we get with these groups, and and I, and I can understand it. You know, they were getting bored listening to me tell them what work is, and she says, if if, it, if it's so good, uh, you should be able to do this in ten minutes. And so we came up with something called the ten minute teach, and. It, we took American football and explained how it was work and what its elements and components of. And, and now it's online and anybody can look at it anytime they want. It's free. Uh, by the way, I'm just giving away my technology to people. I, I, I don't need to make more money, mm -hmm. etc. Uh, you know, here, have it. I want you to do something with it. So, uh, to go back to these people who have this work, which they want to do, what we really end up doing is giving them a way to clarify the work in such a way that together they all look at it the same way. And that is extremely powerful because now they've reached consensus, yeah, that's our work. And I can guarantee you every group that we've ever worked with always says at the end, man, that is, that is really powerful because that really says what I do. Okay. Now, once that happens, then you can say to them, "Where are the problems?" And they will tell you. They, 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 they're not stupid. They've experienced them, and they will identify where those problems are. So you get them to agree upon that. You're, you're building clarity, consensus, uh, identifying where the problems are, and then you say, "What's the solution?" And they know the solution. Mm -hmm. And they have a framework within which to put this all together. And, and the net net of all that is they are then committed to doing something about it. And if you think about it, that's so different than what we used to do when we did performance technology, which was we were the ones defining things and saying, here it is, here's where the problems are. You know, we, do, we know how to do needs assessment, you don't. And uh, here it is, and here are some suggested solutions. And they go, yeah, well, that sounds good. And they may or may not do a damn thing about mm -hmm. it. The other way, they are absolutely committed to do something about it. And also, I think it's important to understand that in that process, they're learning what we do. They are learning a systems approach to something so that when we are long gone, and we have a company, a, a big company, uh, in the technology business, chip business, who is still using that concept to this day. And they sit in there in meetings and start, start talking about inputs and consequences and conditions and so on. They're using systems thinking to, to analyze the problem themselves and solve it without having to hire me, you know, to come back and charge them umpteen dollars to be able to guide them through how to do it themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what I'm trying to do is change the face of, of us of performance technologies, which, by the way, are the next to HR people, are the worst people to try to change. And yet that's our business. We're in the business of change. And if we can't change, then I don't know how we expect them to change. So uh, I'm finding our own people in our own business more resistant to the language work uh, than I do executive managers and workers well if you're so, if you're teaching people to fish rather than fishing for them yeah then you uh, got a bunch of fishermen here who will be out of work uh, but uh, yeah I think when you empower people to take the wheel so to speak and sure. run it themselves um, it's much more powerful because they can come as you say to consensus they can come to uh, a, an agreement on what to call things and how to label things and uh, pinpoint their own problems and solve them and it's much more powerful than having somebody come in from the outside who may not understand the nuances uh, but yeah I think that's very powerful I'm, 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 I really like what you've done yeah I, I think uh, it, that may have came out of that Peace Corps experience believe it or not mm -hmm. that makes sense because we were going over there to give them a skill for them to do it themselves mm -hmm. And uh, realizing that's what we were up to, uh, then coming back to the United States and being, being able to learn a, a technology, a methodology for doing this that uh, was a lot more disjointed than I was led to believe, mm -hmm. <laughs> and able to finally come up with a, a 
some way to organize it around the notion of what work is. Before we move on here to my next set of questions here, I want to take you back a little bit to talk about uh, learner-controlled instruction. It is, again today, a big deal. And there's focus on this and how do we um, empower um, learners to take over, uh, take over the responsibility for their own learning and such. Um, constructivism uh, is one approach here where you let people go off and just learn things with, through informal learning means. Um, but so, so I'd like to go back to what would be your short definition of what learner-controlled instruction is? What are some of perhaps the elements of that? Um, and what what of your writings in the past uh, might be of interest to people watching this video to want to go explore that a little bit further? Well, I don't mind doing that. It, it's it's a very limited kind of you know application. Thing. Okay. We've got a phone going off. Do you want me to stop it? No. Now? Okay. Uh, the concept isn't very difficult. Uh, neither is the application of it, in my opinion, that particularly difficult either. Uh, it, it really says, uh, uh, you know, people come with knowledge and experience into most situations, and we should take advantage of that. I'll give you a, an analogy to that. Uh, when I was at the American College of Life Underwriting, one of the things I realized was that we have all these people from the life and health insurance business and we were running uh, a, a, an exemplary class one in all the subjects we had and these people have a great deal of knowledge that they come they come with and and, and then we assign them things to read just like we do in high school or whatever mm -hmm. and then we don't do a damn thing about it okay so i came up with a system uh, called the construct lesson plan and what it was is I simply figured out a way based on objectives and so on to sort of test out what they already knew when they when they walked in the classroom let's take 15 minutes 20 and figure out what they do and and I was simplistic enough in those days I can imagine doing it now with a computer and I had a, a wheel which they could give their responses colors mm -hmm. in each question and what, what the instructor was able to do is then put together a lesson plan based upon that and could skip or gloss over or review what they already knew. Mm -hmm. And it improved the instruction tremendously in two ways. One, what they were learning, and the other was actually taking account of what we asked them to do in the first place. Well, learner control instruction isn't any different than that in a sense, conceptually. It really says people come, all, all these people come with varying levels of knowledge and experience and so on. Let's capitalize on that. Let's figure out, uh, or have them figure out, not us. Let's have them figure out and demonstrate to us what they know. So, it only requires two things. One, uh, is the objective of saying this is this is the skill if you want to call them competencies or whatever the hell else they are in this I swear these terms are just made up so somebody can make some money as a consultant mm -hmm. but anyway uh, this is what you need to learn demonstrate master whatever you wish to call it uh, can you do it already well here's something we're going to test you out on it there's various ways that we can test you based upon what the behavior is in that objective. So we can do that. Uh, and then you can skip those things and go on to the other things. And so if, if you can structure uh, any kind of learning situation where, where that's allowed to happen, that's learner control instruction. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's not, it's not step by step. You have to do this and bore yourself with something you already know. It's just do it. So, uh, I think people can figure out the mechanics of what that is. Sure. But do you have any uh, writing that from the uh, past that you well, can recall? I don't think you can find it anymore, <laughs> but uh, the best book written on learner control instruction was written by uh, Frank Widra mm -hmm. at uh, part of that uh, instructional design library. Mm -hmm. uh, 
there's somebody that has that electronically online for which we don't get royalties anymore. Uh-huh. I've seen it for a few of the books. I don't think the entire series is there, but they might look for that. And sometimes, you know, if, if you just Google something, it'll come up mm-hmm. and you can get it that way. I will look for that. I, I, in fact, out of your 40 books, that was the one that I had in my library. <laughs> um, and somebody borrowed it, and it's one of those, you know, <laughs> books that walks away and never returns itself to its place in the That's bookshelf. Picture. I have a com- one complete set of the books. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd like to pass on someday to somebody so that it's somewhere. I don't think my granddaughter really wants <laughs> these books. But if you know of a source that would want those, a university, mm-hmm. what have you. Uh, the other uh, entity that has a full... A copy of those is the University of Idaho. I gave it to them for what they did for me. Mm-hmm. That soon after they were published, whether they still have them or not is another matter. Sure. They never sent me a thank you note. <laughs> Probably yeah. somebody that uh, got them from the mail room took them home. Uh, you never can tell. Uh, let me shift gears here slightly and ask uh, one of the questions. Um, that's part of my standard uh, interview guide here, mostly for me to get me from the beginning to the end of this. But uh, if you were to give us a 30-second elevator speech on what you currently do or what you most recently did as a consultant, can you, do you have some succinct way of, you know, the, a new neighbor moves in and they're at a neighborhood party and they ask you, Danny, what do you do for a living? What would have been your response? Uh, I think the way I currently do it is I innovated a business model, basically, that uh, companies can use to organize or reorganize their efforts in order to achieve alignment of the work so that it isn't wasteful, a transparency so that everybody understands it, which empowers them, and then it it achieves continuous improvement because we're teaching them a system in order to do it. So this is a model that can be used for anything that's work. Now, in in business, there's all kinds of work. Mm-hmm. And if and if, if if in fact if there is a work formula, I think this is it. And if it's not, tell me, show me another one. Mm-hmm. It actually is. But the power of the work formula, as in, and, and, and I always am a little hesitant about this, as in science, is this predictability, mm-hmm. you know, and its clarity around uh, what's being done. So my elevator really has to do, it's a, it's a, it's a business model. Uh, and I might add, just to add on something here, a challenge for others that if somebody would like to make a, a gajillion dollars one will develop from this formula a, a business dashboard I call it the business optimization dashboard and there's a YouTube link to my discussion of this which, which is a few years old now maybe I don't know four or five because uh, there are plenty of dashboards out there, but most of those dashboards have to do with uh, economics, you know, financial kinds of things, uh, measurement of processes, and so on. But there's not one that really deals with the human side of things and what the language of work does through that work formula. It will. It does allow you to put on the computer all of the process, all of the business units, all the processes, all the jobs, all the work groups. It will allow you to put on there the standards and the work support and the human relations and the financial. It's all in there. And if you can put all that out into a computer and then have measurements of that, which keep feeding the data into that, as a manager, you should be able to sit at this laptop and look and see what the work is and what's going on. Okay. Now that's a true dashboard of the business itself, but and I find that exciting. But I find something else far more exciting than that, which challenged me on that, and that is that 
you should be able to, once that's in place, run simulations against it. Mm-hmm. And interestingly enough, that takes me back to the University of Pennsylvania. Because when I was at the University of Pennsylvania, in the Annenberg School of Communication, they told me one time, come up with uh, your proposal for uh, your thesis. So I went out and I started looking at stuff just in general. And I came across something at the RAND Corporation. And for those who don't know what the RAND Corporation, that was the think tank back in the day, uh, far advanced of what other people were doing. And I have a good friend actually at work there. Uh, and I came across something that they called operational gaming. And today we call it simulation. And now we call it artificial intelligence and so on. There's a progression to this stuff. It just wasn't thought up one day. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I presented that idea. I'll never forget presenting that idea in class, you know, at the, at the Annenberg School. And the professor turned to me and he said, you know, you're nothing but a damn technician. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because <laughs> I'm, talk- I'm not talking about theory, yeah. which the Annenberg School is about. But I'm talking about application, and I said thank you, because I knew that that I was a technician in the sense of making stuff practical. Right. So you reel ahead to what I'm talking about now, is that I'm talking about being able to run a scenario against that dashboard of something that the company wants to add on, change, do something. And it, and it would help predict what might happen before you do it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's going to be possible someday. And, and I, I, I put it out to the challenge to others uh, to take this work that I've been, had the pleasure of doing and doing that dashboard, doing those simulations, that's the future for me. And so right now, we, we keep our hand in, in the business in two ways. The one is writing. I mean, I, I just seem to enjoy writing. I don't know why. I'm actually writing a guide now for husbands on how to be good husbands. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that would be fascinating. Uh, but, so writing, and then we're doing certification. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to certify people individually, but sometimes we certify them in companies. So we're over at a, right now at a major company in this area, uh, certifying uh, about 60 of their or training, I should say, training and uh, certifying in some instances, them in the language of work. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, what I'm looking for people to do is either through the work chiller, trilogy, just pick up that information, read it, see how that they can use it. And I'm always saying to them, you can ask me a question. That's the tradition of ISBI. Mm-hmm. ISBI. It didn't take me long for somebody said to me, you can go ask Robert Megger anything you want. Mm-hmm. So I started doing it. Or Tom Gilbert. You, know, you have to put up with some attitude. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the price of admission. If you're going to ask Tom something, and I did, uh, or you know uh, Frank Wydra, until they understand that you have something to offer. Mm-hmm. And once they do, <clears throat> if you've got it, they will keep it on you. So true. And that, that's where you really learn. And that's, that was the lesson of ISPI for me. Yeah, so true. It was a great organization for me to become the person that I am. I agree. That it was, it's been so impactful for me, too. Let me uh, shift gears here a little bit here to the, the next question. Uh, this is about terminology. Uh, so this will be right in your, uh, in your ballpark here. Uh, so... Is there a favorite, or maybe it's not a favorite, performance improvement term or phrase that you would like to define for us because perhaps you feel it's being misused and so you would like to put your spin on it, you would like to clarify its meaning, its use, something. uh, Do you you have one for us? I'm sure you do. You know that I do. Yes, I know you do. (laughs) You have many, I'm sure. But I've written at least two or three articles on taking the H out of HB2. Yes, get the, the, no, it's it's get the H out is how it's phrased, (laughs) I believe. Uh, I can't help it. Uh, Yes, uh, I I think 
<laughs> use the phrase, we're barking up the wrong tree here with the use of the word performance. I would, I, I'm not saying totally get rid of it, mm-hmm. but I just think it, it, you know, it's funny when I Google it sometimes, really what I get is performing arts. You know? Yes. And, and, and performing arts is performing, I understand, but it, it, it doesn't come up and say it's, it's performance technology. Right, <laughs> you know? right. Or that thing. And I just think it's, uh, it's not a thing that our population resonates out there with in a big way. So if, if I were running the world and uh, running just that small world of ISPI, I would drop the word performance and I'd substitute the word work. And, and I'm very selfish about that because um, work is the thing they understand. Yeah. You know? And we should be in the business. What we should become, I'm always telling people about this in my uh, workshops that I do for this uh, company, uh, is that we should become the experts in work. Okay? And what we do is we come and we help facilitate people to understand their work. That's what we do. We don't try to do it for them, and, you know, do the analysis ourselves. We get that group of exemplary performance together and we say, okay, let's define your job, your work group, your processes, your business. Facilitate them through so that they understand it. And, and so we are facilitators of things. And, and once they come to the understanding of it, then we should have in our back pocket some ideas around solutions. Okay. Uh, most of which that's, that information is embedded in, embedded in interventions. So knowing what the variety of interventions are is important, which is one of the reasons why I wrote that book in the first place around the various interventions. You need to have that knowledge of how to solve things. Not that you're going to say this is the one you use, but you can, as they're figuring out uh, solutions, you can say, you know, there's this other thing over here. Why don't you think about that? Or why don't one one of you go and you know, here's a source on that? Go read it, and then they'll come back and say, "Oh, hey, this looks pretty interesting." So, this professional is a uh, this profession of ours uh, is 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 work experts. Mm-hmm. It's not performance experts, and it's ones that understand, facilitate things so that they can come up with the answers maybe aid them in some of that process to help kind of move things along. And then one of our other key roles is how to measure those things yeah. and to make sure the measurements are done so that, that what we've done actually proves that it works. That part of our technology has always been something that people uh, just put to the side. Mm-hmm. I can't tell you how many presentations I went to where we would say, and where's your proof? And, Right. There wasn't any, yeah. you know, and we know that that's a, that's a failure, but there's a way to, to uh, solve that failure, too. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, we talked about this a little bit earlier. I, uh, part of my standard set of questions here is uh, I'm trying to elicit some stories of people from the past or present, um, but you have a rich history going back with uh, ISPI and the whole work expertise movement, to coin a new phrase, um, and you, we talked about that uh, you might be able to, to share with us uh, some story, a funny story or a serious story uh, of Frank Wydra and Joe Harless and Bill Dedeline and Susan Markle Tiemann and perhaps Donald Pollock. So wh- okay. where would you like to start here and uh, share with us something that uh, helps us understand a little bit about the, each one of these people? Sure. Well, I think I've already done two or three of them. Yes, you uh, have. Certainly, Susan Markle Tiemann was a, a big thing to me. I always remember also Bob Mager. Uh, every time he'd publish a book, he would send me a copy. And I, I was really, now I know he did that with a number of people, and he had reasons for doing that. But he'd always put right up, and you know, he did, he, he would say, to Danny Langdon, who needs this like a rusty zipper. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And and I thought he was just trying to be funny for a while, but I came to understand that he he thought I had something to offer, okay, and that I knew things, and so I, I really was like the Susan Markle thing. I, I was flattered, mm-hmm. both flattered, but honored that, that they would think that way. Um, 
I told you about Bill Dennerline. Uh, there were so many things that he would do, uh, which uh, endeared himself to me. He he was he was a smart ass mm -hmm. through and through, and he, he he would tell you he was a smart ass. He had little cards that said smart ass on them, <laughs> and he'd write your name and give it to you. I thought that, that that's Bill. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Uh, I remember the first time I ever met Tom Gilbert in uh, in a bar, mm -hmm. and uh, he asked me something. I forget what it was, but I was taken by the fact that uh, as crusty as he was, and he really was, he could just be a son of a bitch. Mm -hmm. Particularly if you thought he, you didn't know what the hell you were doing, uh, he really treated me nicely. I was—I don't know why he did. Uh, he may have seen a presentation I'd given or something, but he was really nice to me. And I, and I those relationships, uh, big and little, really have an impact on you. I, I suppose the funniest thing that ever happened was the Frank Widra. Uh, episode. <laughs> and you'd have to really know Frank, uh, and I don't know how to describe him. But you can ask Kathleen; uh, she worked for him, so she knows him better than I do. But we we formed a really nice friendship uh, and respect for one another. Uh, part because uh, he was one of the authors in that instructional design library, mm -hmm. so that 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 helped a great deal. And uh, and I knew how to, as quiet as I am, it was in those days, I knew how to give it back if it was necessary to give it back. But I think he, again, respected what I knew. So anyway, there was, uh, he was the one who led the uh, charge on organizing and making the success out of the MSIT Michigan chapter of ISBI which was this phenomenal organization. It was more organized than ISPI was. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was very smart because he would have invite people to come, the Rumbler, whoever, Toasty, and they'd come for free. And then he'd get all the benefit of teaching the people there what they needed. And uh, that's something for chapters to do. I, I try to support chapters all the time and just say, look, if you want to do a webinar with me or something, I'm, I'm available, I'll do these things. Mm -hmm. Now, they don't always do that, but I, I have one coming up here pretty soon. So anyway, uh, Frank always um, attended these um, presentations given by whoever was invited in. Well, I don't know who the person was that was invited, but apparently Frank did not like what this person was saying. And if Frank did not like something, he either would stand up and tell you that's a bunch of crap, or he'd, he'd express himself in some other kind of way. And in this case, what he did, he grabbed a pair of scissors and he literally went over and cut the cord on this, I think it was a slide projector the guy was using, mm -hmm. and ended the program, mm -hmm. you know, and <laughs> the, the weird part about it, I was going to be the next speaker the next month. Well, the word got out, got back to me that, that this had happened, <laughs> and I and I understood. I, I, I knew Frank and well enough to know that this is, this is not unusual behavior for him. So when I got up to speak, I said, there's a little something I want to do before I start speaking. I'd like to have Frank Wider come up, and I have for him a, uh, a, uh, a wire cutter and about eight foot of cord, and I would like him to go back to his seat and sit down and, and cut this into various pieces while I'm making my presentation. <laughs> Not to finish it until I'm finished, <laughs> Frank. <laughs> and he took it in great stride, of course. Hopefully, I must have said something right in the presentation because he never came up and cut the cord on my projector. So. And you had armed him. I had armed him. That was him. my just... first NS NSPI the, from the old days before it became ISPI. At MSIT, that was my first chapter meeting in September of 1979. And I was 
somebody was explain Brian Desitels was standing there and either he or somebody else was explaining to me what had happened at the last meeting and Frank had cut the cord on the projector and said this is bullshit let's all reconvene to the bar because they always <laughs> had a dinner meeting oh, yeah. rubber chicken meeting and if there was a restaurant there'd be a bar there and so everybody got up and went over to the bar and then you told me years later when you heard me uh, repeating the story that you were standing to the side there and heard me mention that and knew that that was um, that was what you were going to face there. But, uh, yeah, you he know, did great things similar. at MSIT and uh, now the Michigan chapter of ISPI. Um, very, very uh, uh, important in my professional development and the whole society and everything else. Uh, Something similar happened, by the way, with Gay Bofice one time, I remember. I was at the Washington chapter. I wasn't presenting, but I was standing there. And Gabe was standing at the at the back. And he's just he, Gabe was a very short, stocky mm -hmm. guy. But he was a legend, you know, in, in in the field. And he just stood there and I remember standing next to him and said, That's just such a bunch of crap. <laughs> you know. And if people knew it was crap, they they, they didn't mind saying so. And I got to tell you, I, I've gone to several presentations at ISP. It's been a long time now. But there were times that I thought, what the hell are we talking about this for? This really isn't what is a part of the technology to make it better. Now, that's pretty damn nervy on my part to think that way. But uh, these people like Ofash and Rydra and so on were very important people to have because they were keeping us honest yes. about we're doing, and, and if you're not contributing to it, to it uh, it's, it's okay to give an example of something that works, but if, if you're not really contributing to that and you're just up there to, uh, to meet some kind of requirement to, to give a presentation, otherwise you don't get reimbursed, what the hell's the point of it? Mm -hmm. and, and a certain level of honesty uh, that has to be in the profession uh, to be a successful profession. And these people who were all a part of this in the, in those early days and, uh, were people of strange personalities, no question about that. But they had an integrity about their uh, their work and what was to come of this thing that they were mutually helping to develop, mm -hmm. hopefully educate other people on. So they were serious folks. Yeah. Well, thank you for those stories and the stories earlier in this uh, interview. Um, as a uh, kind of a wrap to our interview, I'm looking for parting words of wisdom or guidance that you might give to people entering the field. Uh, what would you say to them as, as new people come in and you know start climbing the learning curve? Uh, what can you share? I think the first thing is is you got to make sure you're suited for this field. <laughs> I I just because you go through an academic program doesn't mean you're suited for the field. Uh, you truly have to be a person who has the right attributes, like any job. Let's face it, uh, we've done a lot of work around that kind of business where you you take some exemplary performers, you know, and you test out their attributes. We normally use the Colby index for that purpose because it's pretty good. Uh, and if you're coming into this field, uh, just because you signed up for the course at Boise State University or wherever, uh, don't do that because it just sounds kind of interesting. Uh, you better be a person who uh, enjoys change, enjoys working with others, uh, is willing to change. Um, I'm sure there are many other attributes to that, but that's one thing. Then the other thing, which I learned along the, the line, was certainly uh, to ask questions. Uh, it was made clear to me that you could ask anybody anything. Uh, just be prepared <coughs> to know what the hell you're talking about. Uh, so I'm always telling people, who go through our certification or not, uh, or just email me and say, uh, I, I find your work to be 
interesting. And I say, okay, here's here's the source you can go to. Now, when you do, ask me some questions. Mm-hmm. Well, they don't. Uh, a few of them do. I got a guy in India right now that asked me all kinds of questions, uh, which is wonderful. But uh, you have to be a person who's willing to, to ask the questions and learn from that person's uh, experience. So uh, those are two or three things I think it might be useful. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you again for doing this interview with me. Um, uh, I I wish you well in your retirement. And but I don't. I have the feeling that you're not really retired. You're just semi-retired uh, and enjoying life uh, a little bit more. And uh, but still contributing. Thank you so much for all that you've done over the decades that I've known you. Um, and hopefully your work continues. <laughs> You know, decades, centuries into the future. Uh, Oh, sure. Yeah. (laughs) Thanks again, Danny. Have a great day. Thanks, Guy. All right. Bye-bye.